So as, as you see, the set has been changed. We've had a crew uh, taking things down and putting things up. Um, and we will, uh, we did this intentionally and deliberately. This is billed as an armchair conversation. So the format's gonna be quite different than um, the previous sessions. Um, this session is all about, so given that we know what the issues are or um, we are clarifying what the issues might be and what are some of the policy implications and what are some of the recommendations, we heard over the past few days about the need for uh, a whole of government approach and a whole of society approach with many, many different actors and many, many different stakeholders uh, all needing to be involved to address uh, some of the issues that we've been talking about for the past couple of days and what we do. And this panel is not just about what should we do, it's about who should do it and how uh, the various sectors uh, might work together, might collaborate, might take on uh, particular roles. And we tried to put together a panel of people um, who are uh, terrific in their own rights, but also represent certain um, sectors or certain perspectives from uh, different uh, players in society. And, and the moderator will introduce uh, them and introduce uh, the theme more fully, but it's my job to introduce the moderator. And the moderator is uh, John Stackhouse, who um, many of you may have read. Uh, John is currently the uh, vice president at, at RBC um, in the uh, CEO's office. CEO's office, right? Yes. Um, but he, uh, he also is... Uh, the former editor-in-chief of the Globe and Mail. He is a, a former uh, foreign correspondent, particularly based in, uh, in India. He has written several books, which I'm sure many of us in this room have read and uh, have been quite influential in their articulation of, of issues that uh, we are grappling with. So it's a real pleasure to have John act as moderator for this session. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Naomi. Thank you. Uh, can you hear us all or hear me at the back? It sounds like there's a bit of an echo, so that's good. Thumbs, uh, thumbs up. Um, we thought we'd do things differently here. Uh, so roll with us uh, as, as we uh, try something different. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes, uh, particularly about a report we did at RBC called Humans Wanted. And then we'll have a lively discussion here and really want to bring this uh, down to reality. If we could name this uh, panel uh, differently, it might be the reality check. Uh, we've got some great practitioners here with decades of experience in different aspects of what we've been talking about over the last 24 hours from more from a policy point of view. And we're hoping to draw out of them sort of a sense of what's going on uh, in, uh, in the private sector, in government, uh, in other areas of, uh, of our society, including academia, and what should go on. Uh, particularly what might be possible in the next uh, few years. Uh, I'll quickly run through the panel and give them uh, better introductions, but you've got uh, their, their, their bios here. To my far left is uh, Vast Bedner, who you would know uh, both in her current role at Airbnb, but also as an advisor to the federal government, and we'll hear a bit more on, uh, on that. Next to her is Catherine uh, Chandler Critchlow, uh, deep experience, which uh, uh, you can read about in, uh, in, uh, in her bio, but she'll talk about uh, a lot of what's going on in Ontario and give us a sense of uh, some of the opportunities there. Uh, my former, and I think still feel like you're a current colleague, Zabin Herji, uh, uh, who is now with Deloitte but was with uh, RBC for, uh, for a number of decades, and she and I worked very closely uh, on, in the origins of this report and a lot of the issues we'll be uh, talking about. And then last but not least, Alan Shepard, you all know from uh, his esteemed career at uh, Concordia, uh, as well as Ryerson before that, uh, and really excited to hear his thoughts on uh, what's, uh, what's going on in, in academia. Um, it's great for me to be back here at Queen's, because I studied here uh, a number of decades ago. I won't say how many decades ago. And I've got two children now enrolled here, so I'm very invested in this, uh, in this campus. And I've just joined the board of trustees here. And when I joined the board, I, I was pretty frank with them. I said, 
the amount of change that I see going on in institutions like this is nowhere near the change that is afoot elsewhere in society. And you've got a reckoning coming. And I'm happy to be part of that reckoning in a constructive way, if I can be, uh, but it's coming. I lived through disruption in media. I'm seeing it now in financial services. And I share this talk with any audience who will listen. There is no group in society who is immune from the forces of disruption, which tend to be more positive than negative, by the way, but it can be both. There's no group in society that is immune from that. And there were some signals that I picked up over the last 24 hours where I thought, hmm, boy, this group feels like they are immune. Uh, so I hope we can debate some of this today about the, the immunology of, uh, of disruption and of institutions uh, like this. And I'm often reminded of a great quote I heard once from, uh, from uh, Larry Summers, the Harvard economist and former uh, Treasury Secretary, who put it brilliantly. He said, disruption always takes longer than people expect. Always takes longer. And when it hits, it hits with a force that no one thought imaginable. We felt that in media. It took a long time. And then when it hit, wow, and it's still hitting. And we're seeing that in financial services. And I think it's gonna hit a lot of the areas that we're talking, uh, talking about here and that we tried to tease out in this report, Humans Wanted. So why, why is a bank like RBC interested in, uh, in this space? I get asked that a lot, and it's a good question. Uh, and I'll give a few quick, uh, quick answers. Number one, we hear about this pretty much from every client across the country. Everything you've talked about in the last 24 hours, I hear about from greenhouse operators, from factory operators, from hospital administrators. Talent and skills and human capital is the number one issue for them. When we talk about you know, how much they're going to need to borrow for the next decade, that's <laughs> what banks talk to them about, the conversation quickly turns to who's going to put that capital to work? And how are they going to put it to work in a way that we get the money back and that you get a return on top of that? It's becoming the number one question that our CEO gets from international investors. When a big pension fund from Europe or New York is deciding whether to invest in RBC or JP Morgan or Deutsche Bank, First question usually now is, what's your, what's your talent strategy? I can read your balance sheet. That's fine. And it kind of looks like other balance sheets. I want to know your talent strategy, because that's what's going to differentiate you. If I'm in this with you for, for the long term, for five or 10 years, you're going to outperform your peers based on talent. So I need to know from a CEO level what's your talent strategy. So this is, this is you know, to use the cliche, mission critical uh, for, for our clients and for, uh, for us as well. From an economics point of view, and I, I have responsibility for economics department uh, at RBC, and we've been doing more research on this, we think this is a huge opportunity for Canada. If we can help the generation now coming into the workforce, 8 million millennials, or un or people under the age of 30, coming into the workforce right now, if we can help them achieve the G7 average of productivity, so we're not talking about a whole lot of aspiration here. We're just trying to get up to the class average for the G7. $40 billion dividend for Canada. That's a huge payoff. So when we think about how are we going to finance the universities and hospitals and pensions of tomorrow, well, there's one way we're going to do it, is to ensure that the generation coming into the workforce has the skills uh, and talent that we've been talking about over the last uh, 24 hours. The payoff is there for, uh, for all of us. And then lastly, we, we wrestle with this as, as an employer, because uh, we're going through a massive workforce transformation. And here's the crazy thing. This came up yesterday. You cannot predict what's going to happen in, in the jobs market. So with the, I don't know how many people know this. We just marked the 50th anniversary of the ATM. <laughs> 50 years ago, ATMs were introduced. As long as I can remember, people were predicting kind of mass disruption in financial services. Why on earth would you need a branch? Why do you need banks even when you've got technology that seems to manage these transactions? Fair, really fair assessment. So in 2007, when a lot of these predictions were very loud and clear, RBC had 50,000 employees in Canada. Today we have 57,000 employees. So maybe you can explain what they're all doing. Uh, but they're, they're, they're actively engaged. The business is growing. They are, they are economically relevant 
more so today perhaps than, uh, than ever. The financial services sector in aggregate in Canada since the year 2000 has grown by 42%, I think it is. It is double the rate of the labor force growth of uh, or employment growth in the country. So in 2000, a smart person would have said, financial services is probably gonna shrink. That's gonna, you know, if we had that speech or speeches from yesterday, 20 years ago, financial services would have been, had a bullseye on it. And yet it's grown from, from 500,000 to about 700,000 employees across the country. And the, the, the sector is producing more revenue, more economic wealth, uh, more productivity per employee. That's innovation. That's innovation in a very positive way. So let's not underestimate that, uh, that, uh, that power. So let me touch on uh, Humans Wanted. Uh, we, we launched this report a year ago, a little over a year ago, uh, as part of a bigger initiative where we looked at the landscape in Canada, especially at this opportunity for youth in the country. And we made a strategic commitment, uh, which Sabine was critical to, to allocate half of our philanthropic donations. RBC gives away 1% of its profits a year through our foundation. So 100 million or so per year. Uh, we decided over the next 10 years, half of that, 50 million a year, 500 million over the decade, is going to go to groups and efforts to help Canadian youth prepare for a future of work that is going to be significantly different from anything we know. We think the challenge, the threat to youth is significant, but the opportunity is even greater if we can support them to get this, uh, to get this right. And as part of that investment, we thought, well, we should bring some intellectual rigor to this and have a better assessment of where we might be going in terms of the skills that that generation is going to need to succeed uh, in the decade ahead. So we put together a really smart team of economists and data analysts. We built a database of two million or so job postings. We developed our own algorithms and analyzed what skills are in more demand, what skills are in less demand across the, the, the Canadian economy. And came up with some, some fascinating uh, findings, which I'll quickly uh, touch on. Um, and then we, we interviewed, including many of you across the country, just to get a, a real assessment of uh, some smart thinking on this. Number one, we think there's going to be more jobs, not, not less. And this is true in every technological revolution that you can study over the last 300 years. You can't predict what the jobs will be, where they will be, but there will be more jobs, not less. The more technology, the more automation we have, the more jobs there are going to be. We think two and a half million more jobs over the next uh, five years. An example I love to share is on, on the smartphone. You would think these could be assembled by robots, and that would be a really good assessment. There are robots today that can make the iPhone 4 or 5 uh, pretty, pretty well. One of the companies that makes these is called Flex Manufacturing. They've got 200,000 employees around the world, and I got to meet their CEO. He said, here's the crazy thing. I cannot find a robot or a robot producer who can make a robot who can make the next generation of these phones. Because the smartphone five years ago consisted of 800 components. Today it's 3,000. Robots can't keep up with that. Here's the other crazy thing. He can't find a human who can keep up with that. But he can pair humans and robots to make these with each generation that we're all demanding as users. And we are seeing that across, uh, across the economy. Second finding, we're going to see a lot more demand for the four C's, and we heard about this yesterday. Communication, collaboration, critical thinking, complex problem solving, and we're not teaching for those. We're not developing those. We don't know how to even define or measure those. So big challenges that I think the group will, uh, will talk to. And I hear this from employers across the country. There's a wonderful co company in Regina called Miro Developments that makes water systems. And the guy who owns the company hires every engineer he can find out of the University of Regina or anywhere else. Only problem is none of them have global thinking skills or collaboration skills because they don't teach that in engineering schools. So he's actually hired someone as a mentor, full-time mentor for his engineering staff before they go off to Haiti or Cambodia to develop those what we might call soft skills. Those are mission critical, high value, hard skills for him but uh, we're not de delivering those for them. You probably hear that from employers everywhere. Number three, digital awareness. Growing, 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 but it's not coding. We do not need to be a nation of coders. In fact, that would secure some level of unsuccess for Canada if we were a nation of coders. We need lots of coders. We need more coders than we're producing now. 
Uh, we need Canadians who are digitally aware, who are digitally literate, who know how to collaborate with coders, get the best out of them, network with them, but we don't need a, uh, a nation of, of coders. It's fascinating to see what's going on out in the workforce in terms of what is required of employees today. I'll give an example of forestry companies where everything is data driven. If you're a forester now, you have to be able to stand in a, in a, in a forest with a sensor and an iPad and zap trees with your sensor to understand the economic value of that tree, when to cut it, where to cut it, how to get it to, uh, how to, get it to the road. The actual cutting is going to be done by robots. That's highly automatable, but uh, the, the assessment, the analysis is still very much a human skill. Numeracy, we heard this yesterday, is growing and growing and growing. Uh, and that's a big, big challenge for Canada. If you look at the, uh, the trades of welding, if you're a welder today, and this is particularly acute in the United States, you need to have algebra. That is a basic entry level skill for any serious welding job now in the US, and that will be coming here. Are we training the welders of tomorrow in algebra today? Probably not. Last finding that I want to touch on, and this may be the most important one from our study, is on mobility. We took 300 occupations in the country, and most occupations are made up of 30 to 35 skills. And we were able to put them into six clusters. And within each cluster, you are within five skills of any other occupation in that cluster. And the proximities are very surprising. These are jobs that you may not anticipate that you are near skilled for. And we label them doers and facilitators and the like. And these are not easy skills to develop. You cannot go from being an underground miner to a veterinary technician with a weekend online course. But you actually can make that tr transition fairly easily, probably with a couple of years investment, with a good partner in your employer and maybe in an academic institution. So if you're in the mining industry and you know that the robots are coming, if you go underground anywhere in Canada today, you're going to see a lot of automated machines doing the drilling. If you're aware of that and want to explore opportunities, there's going to be more demand for veterinary technicians in the years ahead. So how do we help you make that transition? How do we prepare you for a new era of skills mobility, which we think is going to be fundamental to Canada's success in the, uh, in the, coming, in the coming decades? few examples, real estate agents. We know what's uh, going on there in terms of disruption. You can actually move very simply to being a police officer. That may not be wanted for every real estate agent, but there's going to be a demand for more police and uh, similar professions uh, in, in the years ahead. How do we help real estate agents or people who are training for that prepare for that job? Greenhouse workers to crane operators. Greenhouse workers, high probability of automation. Crane operators, for a bunch of reasons, not. That's actually a fairly straightforward transition if you have the roadmap to make that, uh, that transition. I could go on and on and on with this. What we're hoping to do with these findings in this report is inform what should be a critical Canadian conversation about how do we prepare Canadian youth particularly with the foundational skills to make these transitions. Because we don't know what the YouTube producer of tomorrow is going to be just like a decade ago. Go, people had no idea YouTube producers was going to be one of the fastest growing jobs in the, uh, in the country in terms of demand. Uh, but we do know that there's going to be a foundation of skills that Canadians are going to need. And then how do we set up the systems, the infrastructure and the institutions and the financial support as well to help people make those transitions, to map out their, uh, their, their mobility, not just from one job to the other, but probably to jobs five and six uh, through, their, through their career. So let me wrap up uh, with a few suggestions to put on the table for our discussion uh, that we've got as recommendations in the, uh, the report. Number one is we've got to change our approach to uh, 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 credentials. Uh, we get at that in the, uh, the report. We're trying to do this as an employer. The easiest thing for decades for RBC to do was to go to a business school like Queens or an engineering school like Waterloo and just say, give us as many people as you can. And we still love those schools and want to hire people from those schools, but we're trying to get beyond the tr credential thinking that has led us into that uh, paradigm. Between 2016 and 2017, I think the numbers are being correct me if I'm wrong, we increased our hiring from colleges by 
So we're seeing lots of wonderful talent out there, and we can train them and help them become the bankers of tomorrow if they don't have the, uh, uh, all the skills that you might get out of one of those, those finishing schools. But as an employer, we have to think differently about uh, credentials, number one. Number two, work-integrated learning. We are absolute uh, evangelists about this at uh, RBC. We bring in 3,000 students a year, probably have the country's biggest work-integrated learning program, and see this as essential to our success as an organization. This is not about creating a pipeline of talent, although it does that. This is not do about doing something great for those 3,000 students, although it does that. This is about driving us as an organization. We had an event the other night, two nights ago in Toronto, uh, for a summer program called Amplify, where we take a small cohort of those 3,000. It's about 150 students now. And our CEO meets them on day one, gives them his biggest challenges, and so puts them on teams and says, go away for the summer. You have access to all the data, the management advice, the resources of the organization to solve these problems. You've never worked in banking before, don't care. You're smart, you're ambitious, you're curious, you're gonna ask questions that my team doesn't think of asking. They came back, we started this under Zabine four years ago with uh, was it 20, 25 students at the time. End of the summer, it was an experiment. Got three patents out of it. We thought, okay, let's double that. Next summer, 10 patents. Great, double it again. Double it again this summer. The other night, it would have blown your mind to see these presentations. 15 patents pending out of, uh, out of that evening. It, and real stuff that you'll see on your, on your phones, driving our business. That's the value of work integrated learning, which we want to, to spread to employers as best as we can across the country, because we think this is critical to Canada's, uh, Canada's competitiveness. We also think it's critical to the transformation of the classroom. And we wanna help colleges and universities on that journey as best as we can to transform the classroom to stay ahead of that disruptive wave that I, uh, that I spoke to at the beginning. Lifelong learning, number three. Uh, big, big challenge out there. And wanna hear uh, thoughts on that from, uh, from the panel as we uh, move forward. We know, I think everyone in this room would agree, we need a far different approach to lifelong learning in this country than we have. Unfortunately, nothing is really in the works that is going to transform us. So at RBC, we're trying to just wrestle with this on our, on our own. We've got 21,000 of those 57,000 employees that I mentioned, 21,000 work in branches. You heard what yesterday what's happening to branches. You all know it. How many of you have been into a branch in the last week, in the last year? <laughs> We know, we know the, the direction, and every branch employee in the country knows what, what's happening. It's nothing as painful as the sound of silence. Uh, and they hear that when, when customers are, not, are, are using this to deal with, their, uh, with their, their bank. So we've launched a program, uh, a digital navigation program for them. We've assigned and trained 3,000 digital navigators to work with those 21,000 to help them think about what else they can be doing within the organization or in other organizations if they want to make that transition. And we've got time. And if I can stress one thing to this, uh, to this audience today, we have time. It's precious. It may be only years. Who knows? It may be months. We don't know. It's not going to be sufficient, though, the time, and it will be shorter than what we anticipate. But we've got time to help these 21,000 people either stay in the branch doing something completely different or move to other positions. So what else might you do in a bank? Well, I don't know how many of you know what a scrum master is or have tried to hire a scrum master recently. Scrum masters run digital teams that do all the wonderful things that we're addicted to, and they are bloody hard to find. And you don't need to be a coder to be a scrum master. But you know what? There's a lot of branch managers who have all the basic skills to be a scrum master. And we've been able to sit down with them and say, you know, you ever thought of being a scrum master? What, you don't know what it is? That's okay, neither did I. Here's what it is. Here's a, a, an education institution or a training program that can help you become that. And my God, you're gonna be in demand when you uh, do that, if you want. And here's some, uh, some other options as, uh, as well. So we're doing this because we have to. Because we may need more people, not less. We don't know. Uh, but we're gonna need really good people. And we've got really good people already. So we just need to ensure that they've got the skills that keep them relevant uh, five years from now and five years uh, beyond that. 
We're hearing this, interestingly, more and more and more from our peers in the United States. The United States private sector is very far ahead of us in Canada on everything we're talking about here. Out of necessity, out of that competitive spirit that is just stronger in the US than it is here. And major employers across the US are working with education institutions, retraining, reskilling, upskilling their workforces because they feel this disruption and they also have labor shortages so they can't afford to lose people. You probably all know the AT&T story. But going to UPS in Memphis, Ten Tennessee, or Boeing in Seattle, or Disney in LA, and you'll see some of the most sophisticated programs on the planet of organizations working with education institutions to help their employees through this, uh, through this, uh, skills, uh, through this skills journey. So lots ahead of us, uh, lots of opportunity, and we want this conversation to be as much about opportunity. I think we've had a good diagnostic yesterday and this morning of some of the, the problems. We can hear about the opportunities uh, from the panelists. Just lastly, a few notes uh, that I made to myself from, from yesterday and have been reflecting on it for the, uh, for the discussion. And maybe we can address this in the panel. There was less emphasis on the private sector yesterday than I might have hoped for and that we need in this country. Uh, policy in this country cannot be developed in absence of the private sector. And the onus is on us to engage in those conversations, to find those conversations, not to wait to be invited and to bring intelligence uh, and experience to those conversations. But as a country, and this is a decades old challenge, we've got to have the private sector more in these conversations. Less recognition, and Vass will get to this, about the gig economy and the changing nature of the economy than I think we're hearing out there. So I want to hear uh, more thoughts uh, on that. Maybe a little less emphasis than we should have on innovation in education, and Alan will speak to some of that. A lot of great innovation going on in education in the country, but the opportunity for a whole lot uh, more, and we have to hold ourselves to, uh, to account for that. And we did hear more and more, especially this morning, about the social context of some of these challenges. But too much of this discussion, including within organizations, uh, tends to um, either uh, dismiss or pay insufficient recognition to the social context of, uh, of these challenges. So I hope we can uh, draw a bit more out about that. So that's the table set for our conversations. We're going to start with uh, Catherine. Uh, who's been doing some extraordinary and interesting work in Ontario, but I think this transfers across uh, the country. So Catherine, let, let's um, open it up with you, and we're, we're going to give five minutes or so to each of uh, the panelists to, to share their insights on a big question. I guess the big question for you is, what is going on, on out there uh, in Ontario specifically, but from the government's perspective, and what can we do to take advantage of that. Absolutely. Um, thanks so much, John, and it's a pleasure to be here. I, I must be fully transparent and say that I'm a science major in a policy conference. So it's, it's been a bit of a catch up. And um, when I hear the, you know, we talk about the future of work, and over the last few days, I think we came away with a number of um, insights. Um, when we talk about what it means, we hear that there, is, um, there are a number of areas that seem uncertain. Competitiveness, emerging business models, globalization, um, global human mobility, and technology, of course. And so coming from a science background, and I hear of all of this uncertainty, it brings to mind for me um, an area in science that we, we, we know as the Heisenberg uncertainty area, Heisenberg uncertainty principles. And what it means, quite simply, is that the more you focus on one particular thing in a myriad of changes, you run the risk of having a blurred vision of everything else. And so an inordinate emphasis on technology or any other area can lead to a lack of understanding of areas such as social cohesion, um, the rule of education, the rule of employers, and others. So those are my key insights coming from the conversation so far. We hear a lot about the emphasis on data and what we need to do to understand an emerging workforce and an emerging need for talent. Um, I come to this area from a human capital perspective. 
and think that it is so important that we understand that skills development, whether we know exactly what work is going to look like in the future, what jobs might be, skills investment is something that will continually boost economic development, social development, and community development. So it's not going to be a loss. And we don't need to be completely accurate on what the new skills might be. We could be approximately right. Um, we can have a sense of what is needed going forward, whether they are digital skills or others. Um, but in respect to where we um, have that puck flow and what we think might be the direction in terms of skills, um, it's important that, that we understand that some regions, like Ontario, um, have been doing a lot of work and a lot of research to understand the supply and demand for talent, understand how the changing nature of work um, could be looked at through the lens of a human capital perspective and with a focus on skills, competencies, and capabilities. And so some of the work I'd like to share um, that has been funded by the Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities, and it's a pity that Erin couldn't be here this morning um, because her ministry and she is largely involved in a lot of those funding initiatives, um, have placed a highlight in a number of areas. The first one of them is that when we look at sectors like financial services, where they continue to say they can't find people, and they can't find people who, have, who can fill particular jobs, we who are working in the immigrant space, youth space, young graduate space, are seeing a number of individuals, a number of demographics who can't find jobs. So here we have a major sector saying we can't find people. We have a plethora of people in our ecosystem looking for jobs who can't find jobs. What is the disconnect? And so in large part because of the research that's being done through MTCU, we are focusing on employability skills and working with employers directly. So John, when you talk about the involvement of private sector, all of the research that we, we do focuses on the private sector. For them to tell us specifically, what are you looking for in terms of skills and competencies and so on? Um, and to be able to share that information with a range of individuals who may be interested or eligible for work in the private sector. One of the things that has evolved is what we call um, skill clusters. Um, we have talked about having soft skills, technical skills, technical knowledge, and so on. Uh, what we're hearing from employers, um, it's, it's more the cluster that is important. And what do I mean by that? Um, we have, for example, a, a cluster that I can describe as a mix of soft skills of empathy, um, along with medical knowledge, and highly analytical and problem-solving skills. So I'll repeat that. Empathy, medical knowledge, problem solving, um, and, and those abilities to work with those competencies. And we ask ourselves, if you have that cluster, what kind of job could you do? And what we are seeing is that that cluster applies to people who are nurses, PSWs, and others. But it also applies, interestingly, to insurance underwriters, health insurance underwriters, because there's an equivalency in the skill cluster needed for someone who is a nurse and that is also needed by someone who is a health underwriter. And we know that many of our insurance companies um, in the GTA and in, uh, in the broader areas in, in, um, in Ontario are in fact hiring nurses and medical practitioners into some of their um, insurance and underwriting areas. Another example, skill cluster, math, Statistics, analytical thinking, problem solving. We do the equivalencies to match where that cluster lines up with jobs. And we see that those, that same cluster applies to areas and jobs such as data scientists, engineers, and risk analysts. What that then says to us is how could we engender the thinking in job seekers that they see themselves less of a product, an educational product, that says they've got this particular qualification and therefore must look for that particular job and help them to be able to articulate the skills and competencies that they have and to be able to tap in to alternative careers across an ecosystem. I would argue if we talk about the future of work, we have to talk about the future of sectors. Is it important that we tell people that you can equally be qualified for a role in healthcare 
as is citizen banking or, or government because you have the critical skill clusters that apply to a number of roles that cross all of those different areas. In, in, in listening to some of the conversations that we've had and the research that we're doing, uh, and we need to think about you know, the people who may be dislocated from whatever the changes might be. Um, I don't know if Sue is still here, but we, we, we know that we heard so much about the, 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 the myriad of people who are going to be um, dislocated by changes, whether it's aut automation or other. Um, and what we look at when we approach this from a human capital perspective is that if we understand the clusters and competencies that people are leaving with from organizations um, from which they are displaced, how could we assess what those clusters might be? This is a highly skilled group that's coming out of our major organizations if in fact they're being displaced because of automation. Where does economic development fit into this? How could we look at improving and expanding um, business opportunities, uh, expanding growth within our SMEs um, to be able to tap into a, a wealth of skills and capabilities that is coming into the ecosystem. We have very little conversation about that, very little conversation about the role that economic development can play in tapping into and working with people who are displaced. Uh, another thing that we hear a lot of is that immigrants and youth continue to have challenges finding jobs. In Ontario, the Durham region, Windsor, continue to experience high levels of youth unemployment. We hear of strategies being used for lifelong learning and for upskilling and reskilling. We're talking about regions where we just need to skill people. They're, they've not even necessarily been developed. So when we look at competency development and the work that we're hearing from employers, it's how do we expand the conversation around skill development to ensure that we don't systematically leave behind those demographics, whether they are the, um, the, the racialized youth, whether they are immigrants, whether they are Francophones who are not getting into the workforce in, 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 in reasonable um, numbers, um, and also looking at the education system in terms of how do we ensure that people are developing the mindset um, and an interest in technical, soft skills, and all the other skills that are being articulated by employers. So we see the challenges that might emerge from the changing nature of work, whatever that might be, to be quite positive for Ontario. Um, and I know yesterday Jacqueline listed off a number of reasons why things are so good for us. One of them that didn't make the list is that we continue to be very highly rated on the Human Capital Index that is issued by the World Economic Forum. We are rated in the top 10 for our education system, for our primary education, where we drop um, in terms of our strength is in workforce engagement, getting people into the workforce. And so if we can focus on those areas of getting people in and developing the skills and competencies that are needed by employers today, we will be more than likely covering the needs going forward. And I close on making one point. I think that um, yesterday we had a, an amazing conversation from, and discussion and insights from um, Harvey in terms of how do we focus on strengthening the skills base and what needs to be done there. And I think a big piece going forward is enhancing employability skills and more work with directly with employers rather than relying on publicly available data. Thank well, you thank so you. much. No, thank you. There's lots to uh, unpack there, which we'll, we'll, we'll get to. Um, and I should note, we're uh, in October launching a, uh, an online tool called Upskill, which will allow uh, anyone, but we're going to promote this to Canadian youth to enter uh, or answer a number of questions to position themselves in these, in these clusters and think about their own uh, skills, mobility, and, and job, uh, job options. Um, Zabine, we've heard a lot over the last uh, day or so about what, uh, what governments are doing, what academia is doing. Uh, a lot of interesting policy ideas. Not hearing enough about what business is doing and should be doing. And I want to use this opportunity with you to hear a bit more about what Canadian business 
uh, is thinking about and doing and, and maybe what we should be uh, doing. Thanks, John, and, and I too, uh, you know, would start off by saying it's been uh, a real pleasure to be here and for me to develop uh, my understanding around the public policy pillar of future of work. Um, and as John has said, equally important, I think, for the business framework and the understanding of that other really critical pillar for the future of work um, in, in terms of uh, the people working in public policy. So, um, and you know, we've talked about collaboration and new models of collaboration, which I couldn't agree with more. I think we need to move to the mindset of co-creation, um, where we are, um, you know, collaboration sometimes feels a little bit soft. Oh, I got their input. Oh, I'll talk to them, you know, in a sequential way. No, let's be in the same room, in the same place, at the same time. Co-creating, experimenting, learning, pivoting, scaling things that are working, and, and taking some of more of those risks in terms of looking for those innovations together. Um, so that's, uh, that's certainly something that uh, is reinforced for me uh, even more. So as I think about what is business doing, what should business be doing, um, let me just quickly frame how future of work fits into the broader business context. And while we've heard some of these things in different presentations, um, I certainly find with clients that we're working with that having that framework is, a, is really a good way to, uh, to move the, the future of work thinking and doing uh, in a more accelerated way. So the, the disruptors, the forces have changed. We've heard about technology. Technology is everywhere. We have the tsunami of data. We have the rise of AI, of robotics. And I think what, what we're hearing from everybody, and that's certainly our point of view, is that there is more positive than there are than there's a downside. The positive side, clearly our clients, our business clients, they're driving a different experience. They're looking for um, for different ways of being served by, uh, by the, where they're buying from, by, their, uh, by, their, by businesses. And that the competitive pressures are fierce. We've also got um, employees who are looking for a different experience. Um, and what we certainly know is in terms of jobs, there's going to be job, new jobs created, there are going to be jobs that are eliminated, and there are going to be a large proportion of jobs that are augmented by technology. So the whole reskilling, upskilling agenda, and it's reskilling and upskilling at scale. And it's not a once and done. It's really building that capacity in our institutions, in our organizations, in the DNA, really, of, uh, of Canadians that, that's in front of us, that's the job that we're all trying, uh, working on tackling, and it's big. And that's where we absolutely need those different ways of collaborating. Demographics, we've touched on it. I think there are three things I would like to, to say there. And it certainly very much aligns with uh, CEOs and business leaders and government leaders really recognizing and, and worrying about getting the right people um, and getting them at the right time, developing them, retaining them. Three demographic trends. Millennials, 50% of the workforce today are millennials, expected to be 75% by 2030. They are looking for different experiences in the workplace. They want flexibility. They want to be learning all the time. They want access to senior management and the breakdown of hierarchy. And they are critical to the growth and innovation in organizations. So that is a force that is also driving um, a lot of the change. Uh, diversity. In, certainly in Canada, diversity is a fact. It's really not up for debate. The, the choice that we've made as a nation is inclusion. And more and more organizations are making that choice not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because it's the smart thing to do. And the third uh, demographic trend, which maybe we didn't talk about as much, is this concept of a 100-year life. You would know it, uh, our colleagues from the UK, not because you're 100 years old, <laughs> um, but Linda Grattan in the UK has, uh, has written about that people are living longer. That means they're going to work longer, some because they have to, and others because they want to. 
what does that mean to the labor market? What does that mean to the next generation that will maybe not have those opportunities because people are actually working longer? And what, are, what, have we, what are we using in our, uh, in our models? Um, so the whole demographic aspect, absolutely critical in thinking about it. And the, the final one is we've talked about societal expectations, and I think the news there is good. Um, Deloitte, uh, just, uh, they do an annual human capital trends survey, and it's, this year it's called the rise of the social enterprise. What we heard from, uh, from clients that we spoke to, that all stakeholders, clients, employees, communities, are really looking for businesses to be profitable and to have social impact. And we're seeing a move with investors. BlackRock is doing a lot around that in terms of really committing to invest in organizations that have more of that long-termism. Um, so those are forces, I think, that are going to play in our favor, where we see businesses wanting to help uh, employees to, uh, uh, to adjust and to be successful in this new world of work. Uh, so how are we going to work together? And it's not a one-size-fits-all um, in terms of what businesses could do. So let me now get to what are businesses doing and could be doing. In this context of reskilling and upskilling, we've talked about engaging other, other stakeholder groups. What about engaging employees in the conversation? We have, to me, this, this sort of notion of radical transparency, it's critical. There's, and that's you know, somewhat new. Many organizations have a more paternalistic approach towards employees, or, or there's that concern, oh, if we start talking about it, we might start to lose people, or you know, there's, people are going to get worried. How is that going to play out in work and in, in, in terms of productivity? The thing is, our employees are hearing about it anyway. Yeah. They're hearing about it in the media. They're hearing it. It's all around. This, this, is, a, uh, you know, this is something you can't um, really get away from. I mean, every time you pick up your newsfeed, every time you read the paper. And so how organizations, I think, can play a much bigger role in engaging employees in the conversation. John, your example of branches and the work that was de done around tellers. And, and really being very frank and, and transparent around this is the technology, this is what our customers are looking for, and this is how it's going to affect your jobs. So let's work together to help you develop other skills. Let's have the time for you to be able to transition into other roles in the organization or outside the organization. And while that's hard in the beginning because there's anger and you know, there's a lot of things that, that the change cycle that you have to work through. Once you get through that, though, employees are actually, um, that's a, a way to retain people, not just the people that you've talked to, but more broadly in the organization, because they see a different level of commitment that organizations have. And the second part around the reskilling is let's start doing things. We can't wait for the perfect data, for perfection. We already know there are essential skills that are going to be critical. So what are we doing to help people develop those skills? Um, and not just through formal training, and this brings me to the second point, which is internal talent mobility. How can we accelerate the opportunities for employees to move across organizations, and in fact, for different businesses in different sectors to partner, to actually move and create that kind of mobility of even across those, and including the, the public sector? Um, where people are getting those new skills, they're being, they're being pushed outside their comfort zone, they're learning how to work in ambiguity. And really, to me, that also brings forth the, a change in culture where people are going from, you know, I learned to work to I work to learn. And, and that, for me, the sustainability of lifelong learning is, is very much dependent on that culture change at a, at a nation level, but at an individual level. And it's not just about jobs, it's tasks, it's activities. Uh, I think we heard about Talent Cloud from uh, the Treasury Board working on, and I think that's the idea there, to sort of an internal um, task gig type of uh, environment. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was, John said to me, oh, real examples, and I didn't want to just use real examples from RBC or from Deloitte, so I, 
sent a note last night in that's connectivity to a colleague um, at another bank, at Bank of Montreal, asking her, them what they're doing. And she, one of the things she talked about was um, they have implemented a, um, um, a, a new online program uh, with, a, with a learning platform called um, Degreed, and it's anytime, anywhere, bite size. People don't have time. What's the five-minute training that you're going to provide to me? And in less than two months, 30% of their workforce are active users. So we know that a lot of people are, are ready and waiting and doing it on their own time. Um, because just like we invest in other things that are important to us, health and wellness, I think, is a great example. We are seeing people, uh, people respond to that. And they've, div they've implemented an help wanted, again, internally, tasks, activities, just things that get people comfortable with doing, uh, with doing new things. And what we know is that our millennials actually want that sort of thing. Number two, so the first is the, the whole reskilling, um, upskilling. Uh, number two is the internal mobility. And the third, I think, promising practice is the uh, individual training accounts. There are experiments or some organizations, and IBM implemented something like that over 10 years ago. Um, and organizations are hesitant to, to go there, yet when I think about many of the benefits plans, you know, we, we look at health and wellness and we, we get comfortable that investing in, in, in those areas are good for the employee and they're good for the organization because they do drive pro productivity. How do we get organizations to see uh, the, the, these individual training accounts as table stakes, really? Um, and what's the partnering? And it'll be different. What big business and, and get, you know, the partnering they require, including funding, I think should be different from small and medium-sized businesses. What we can, what the other thing that needs to be different is getting away from some of this egalitarian uh, approach that we often have, and you certainly see that in benefits plans, is how do you actually provide more, whether it's a match, whether it's the business, whether it's the, uh, the, the, pub, uh, the government, how do you provide higher match to those that are most vulnerable? And what are the wraparound services? Because for, for many people, you know, the course might be there online, but they don't know how to go there. They're afraid to go there. Um, so what are the other services, the mentoring, the support, the, the coaching that we provide to them? What about a registered uh, reskilling plan? I think that's in the, in the um, RBC report, where uh, just like registered education plan and the uh, retirement plan, what about really building, uh, helping to build people's capacity, which in effect will actually help them with their retirement? Uh, this is just getting to it, uh, to it earlier. So those are the three things I would say from a business point of view um, that, um, that we're doing but are promising and things that I think we can scale. And the internal mobility one, uh, that's something we can do start almost tomorrow. It, you know, it's not a long term. I need others to play in that space um, and, and start to really get that learning being so very integrated into work. Great. Thank you. That's fantastic. And lots to, uh, lots to follow up on, on there. One thing that's emerging uh, in, in certainly U.S. business is a, a general agreement that it is cheaper to keep people and retrain them than to let them go. So a lot of large employers have done the math and discover that the, 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 the cycle cost yep. of letting someone go and then going to recruit someone and then onboarding them and then having the, the attrition because you, they, they, many of them aren't going to stay uh, costs more than uh, retraining yeah. a lot of uh, your people. So it's interesting to see those large US corporates do the math. And then there's an interest, so as we can advance this into areas like skills accounts, mm -hmm. and then there's an important arcane accounting debate about how this is how this is costed, but that, that matters uh, very much and could be an incentive for organizations to, to do that. So there's, there's mm -hmm. good momentum actually here to get behind. Alan, when you hear these sorts of things and, and look at what you've done um, over the years, both at Concordia and, and Ryerson and elsewhere, really pioneering a lot, uh, a lot of great things in Canadian education, what's, uh, what's left to be done? What are the opportunities out there for post-secondary education that uh, that you're thinking about and the rest of us should be thinking about? 
Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you. Just before I get started, just uh, close your eyes for one second. Think about your, the institutions you've been affiliated with in Canada or around the world. Maybe you graduated from them, maybe you didn't. Um, okay, open your eyes. Uh, I, I encourage you to, to write the president of those institutions and give them some advice. You're all very interested in the future of work. That's why you're here. You're interested in public policy, and you're interested in how um, higher education institutions can be partners in this process. And you're also taxpayers. And if you stop to add up how much tax dollars go into higher education in this country every year, it's in the billions. And we need to make sure we're getting the most for our buck. Write the presidents, tell them I sent you. <laughs> I'm going to, they'll, they'll thank me, I'm sure. I'm gonna talk very briefly, I hope, about universities, opportunities, experiments, and risks, and I'm gonna talk about a couple of models and things that I've been involved in, things I'm aware of in other jurisdictions. Um, we are partners, and it is, the news isn't all bad. Almost all the change that we're here talking about over the last few days has been initiated in one fashion or another by research done inside universities. So when universities get bad raps as places that don't change, just remember everything from the antibiotics you take to the smart car you drive to the phone that you use to do your job and everything else was pretty much thought about, worked on at some point in a university, often with industrial partners, but not always. Right? So we're not the terrible Neanderlithic places that sometimes we get couched as being, and that's important because if you want universities, as taxpayers, you want universities to be your partners, your investors in them. And if you want that, then you better want them to do well. And they won't do well if you start out by insulting them. All right, so <laughs> it's just a fact, right? We all do better when we think that we're valued. So I'm gonna talk a bit about why is it that universities are so slow to change, and I think we're slower than we need to be. And John's point about how you know, you're gonna get smacked at some point, I, I actually agree with. I published an article in an op-ed in the Globe and Mail a couple years ago uh, that started out tsunami, and I was quoting the president of Stanford, the president at the time of Stanford, and he and many, many others were running around saying, you know, the, the world's gonna collapse in higher education. Those, um, you, you get on stages like this by saying things like that, but it doesn't always really resonate with the people who are like engaging with you. So it's not a tsunami. But uh, John is right that there, is, there are big changes afoot and there are some serious risks for higher education if they don't pay more attention. So things are happening. How many people in Canada right now are engaged in continuing education? I'll give you the number as calculated by Universities Canada in a recent report, 400,000 adults. Now at what's our population, 35 million more or less, something like that. So, that's maybe a couple percentage points, maybe 3% of the adults who would ordinarily be involved in online or in um, ed, uh, continuing education, some kind of lifelong learning. That's pretty low. It's pretty low, and there are a lot of barriers to why more people aren't engaged. And I'm gonna talk about that too. So, things are happening, but things need to speed up. I'll give you some examples. Um, I was one of the people on the team at Ryerson when I was its provost working on the digital media zone which has now got operations in five locations in India. It is an operation in Vietnam, it is an operation on Wall Street, and increasingly it has embedded operations in for-profit companies, including RBC, where it opened an incubator. And that's part of the, uh, the generation of all these patents. That's where it's coming from. So the old model of work in integrated learning go back 30 years was that you took some 20-year-old, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, you had them photocopy, make coffee, sit in on some meetings, and you gave them an academic credit. And that model is mostly gone, I'm happy to say, and if it's not totally gone, it, it ought to be. So work integrated learning is, is something different now, and it can be so much better than it is even, even so. Uh, Universities Canada says we should aim for 100% of students to have this. Realistically, in most institutions, probably something like 10% graduate with work integrated learning. Right? I was aiming for 50% at Ryerson, we didn't get there, um, but we're on that path, and at Concordia, we're on that path as well. And it should not just go to those in like business schools and engineering programs. At Concordia, we've expanded the co-op program to include sociology, uh, English, other languages, history, and so forth. Because those disciplines too, they even need it more than engineering and business, frankly. The, the business school students, are gonna, they're gonna be fine. They, they have a way of thriving with or without us. But students in other programs where the career connections are not as obvious, those, those fields need to be cultivated too. 
So I would argue for co-op for all or some work integrated learning, you have different names for it. And frankly, our models are kind of bare and thin. Uh, Waterloo in Ontario, University of Sherbrooke in Quebec, initiated co-op learning about 50 something years ago. And we haven't really experimented very much with that model since then. So we really need more robust models and we need more pilots and we need more experiments. When we were doing DMZ at Ontario, the members of the Ontario government here, I'm sure, I spent a year meeting with assistant deputies, deputies, and others, trying to persuade them that they should help fund this. And they were extremely risk averse. As you know, government is very risk averse. They don't want to be on the front page of the star for having wasted tax dollars. Only after I had taken our operating money and at some personal risk, because I was worried that if I took operating money, I would have faculty members, maybe board of governors members saying, basically, what are you doing? That money, we should have hired more TAs. Why are you diverting money that's supposed to be for TAs into something, this new thing that we don't know if it'll succeed or not? And then after Prince Charles um, arrived to uh, see us, the, the government of Ontario was magically wanted to be our partner. <laughs> right. I, for those of you who are in public policy, I really urge you not to take that approach. That's not fair, and it's, it's holding back Canada. So incubators now across Canada, there are 60 of them, roughly, over the last 15 years. Experiments uh, outside Canada have been more robust, and in this and so many other things, I'm an American Canadian, I'm a very proud Canadian citizen, um, but I spent a lot of my professional life in Texas, and I can tell you they take more risks and they move faster there, and it's just a reality. So there are three institutions in the US, if you're interested in higher education and how public policy can follow some of the innovations, there are three I would point you to. One is Arizona State University, which Historically, it was kind of a second tier, perfectly good, perfectly solid place, but it wasn't, when you thought of like the pantheon of great institutions, it was never in the list of the, the usual list. Michael Crow became its president about 15 years ago. He's just published a book on the experiments they've been running called uh, Making the Great American University, something like that, Johns Hopkins Press, 2017, I think. Um, he's a friend of mine. He has a lot of connections to Canada. His provost is Canadian. He spent a lot of time in Montreal. I'm sure he would be happy to talk to any of you who are policymakers about what's going on there. Really innovative work in the structure of the of this system. He has focused on access. So that in the old days, you got a lot of glory and prestige. You got high in the rankings, I commented on this yesterday, by how many people you kept out. You could brag about how many people you didn't admit. Right? That's not gonna work in the new world order, right? People who order their Starbucks and their iPhone, they're not very amused by that. And they're not going to be turned on when you say you're one of an elite whatever. A few people will, but the majority, including people who traditionally didn't have access and didn't get to go to university, they're not very amused by that, that way of thinking. That, those days are waning. I think this is John's point you were saying earlier. Right? So Arizona State is one. The second is the Stanford Design School, which is pretty famous these days. They've been doing some work on reinventing undergraduate education. We need experiments, pilots, and real shifts at undergraduate and graduate levels. I'll come back to that. And the third one is Georgia Tech. So Georgia Tech, a primarily engineering school historically, uh, now offers all the range of subjects. It's talking about educating the whole person. I come from the humanities. My doctorate is in 16th century English literature. It's highly relevant to uh, running a $700 million corporation, as you can imagine. And they're talking about educating the whole person, about the skill sets you need. The, the, the collaboration, the, uh, I, I have enough financial acumen, I can successfully run these corporations, but also the skill sets, the comm sets, the writing, the high standards, the flexibility, all that. Georgia Tech has got a center for the future of higher education. They've just issued a report about two months ago, um, and I won't give you the long version because it's fairly long and it's super exciting for those of us who work in this area of policy and thinking. They talked about eliminating the barriers between high school and university. It is astonishing how little university profs know about what's taught in high schools. We've run an experiment at Concordia. We're trying really hard on it, a bridge between the SEJEP system and the university system. SEJEPs provide about 70% of our students. And so we set up a model where we wanted to know, how, why are so many people failing first year math? So we went, we, we, we invited, we convened math chairs across the SEJEP system. What's being taught? How do we make this, not to blame them, just how do we bridge this? Those kinds of models can have huge benefits for that first year university student so they're not flunking out. The second thing they said was flexible pathways. I agree with this, we need kind of a Lego model of credentials. 
The idea that is an undergraduate is going to go away for four or five years to some place far away from home is an old American model. It's just not working. They don't want to do it. And you can look at the demographics around Ontario admissions even, and you can see it. We need short courses. We need micro courses. We need to think about the physical presence of higher education around the world. There are lots of experiments going on in the US. NYU has uh, got about 15 campuses around the world. That's not my preferred model. You, NYU is an uber rich private institution charging $70,000 in tuition a year and so forth and so on with big backing from the private sector. So you can have NYU Dubai, NYU Singapore and all that. The model is going to be more like what Northeastern University is doing in Boston, which also went from being a place nobody had heard of 20 years ago to a really preeminent place that's experimenting. They, have, they open up basically storefronts, pop-ups, if you will. Right? The four things about lifelong learning, coaching, and advising. Come back to that. So why are we so slow to, to, to make change? So profs are by nature cautious. Skepticism is ingrained in graduate training. You're trained to be skeptical. For Zabine to have an idea and for me to say, I don't think so. Show me your data. We've heard that. We've heard that again and again at the conference, right? So that kind of skepticism, when I start saying tsunami, think changes are coming, they're like, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> We've been around a thousand years, we're good. Right? Newspapers were around, what, several hundred years. Things have changed. So profs are cautious. There is a genuine concern for the long-term well-being of students. There are people, I've taught some, uh, when I was teaching in Texas, we used to do these summer three-week courses. And there are people at Concordia who say, three weeks, just I can't do anything in three weeks. What are you talking about? That's just like taking their money and like you're not. But actually some of those, I, I took some three-week courses when I was an undergraduate. Uh, some of them have stuck with me more than the 12-week courses or the 14-week courses, right? It's all about the course. It's not about like how many hours did you sit in the chair. Also, why we're slow to resist. There's not as much research on our own institutions as we do on you. We're happy to research everything else. But when we research higher education, people aren't that interested. And finally, I think that there's a risk about the loss of authority. So one of the things that happened in newspapers is in the old days, I was just having this discussion with a, a national editor, one of the other, one of John's former competitors this week. And she said to me, in the old days, uh, a letter to the editor had to go by me. I decided, my team decided what was newsworthy. Now any idiot with an iPhone can post their own op-ed. And as you know, some of them are deranged. Right? <laughs> you know that. Some of them, they say things about me, some of them are deranged. <laughs> so the loss of authority goes all the way back to the Middle Ages, to this whole construction of universities. Right? You, had, you had knowledge, you had control of knowledge, and you, and you conveyed it. So this unbundling, you know, you're not going to do a degree, but a Lego set of credentials, micro-credentials done on the weekends, done in your summer holidays, that is the loss of authority for our universities that I think is coming. So it's not a tsunami, but what happens if we don't change? One is that there are alternative providers showing up. And in the US, I thought one of the effects of the Trump administration that hasn't really panned out, because not much has panned out, um, what I thought would happen is that Betsy DeVos, as the uh, uber billionaire uh, Secretary of Education, would basically unleash all the horses of for-profit education and they would run around the track like crazy. While universities are busy thinking or having 49 meetings about whether we should do something. Hasn't quite panned out, but remember there are billions and billions of dollars at stake. Often in Canada, especially tax dollars, public dollars. So people are interested, and there are alternative providers popping up. And if universities don't fill that need, somebody will. Right? And as somebody who loves universities and thinks they're fundamental to democratic societies, I want to see that universities are the ones stepping up and not for-profit. I ultimately am not a fan of for-profit education. Uh, there's some arguments to be made both ways. And then finally, I'll just close by saying, in terms of lifelong learning, one of the models that people are talking about now is an open loop model where yes, you graduate, but you don't just graduate and say thank you very much. Canadians are very much like this. Uh, I was surprised when I moved to Canada. Uh, the, except for places like Queens, U of T, Western, a few places where being an alum really matters. In most institutions, it's kind of come and, come and go, right? So personalized education, alumni networks that really mean something, lifelong coaching, and partnerships with, with industry, with taxpayers, with the private sector. 
Uh, and that's very hard and it's expensive for institutions and it really takes collaboration. It's very, very hard to do. It takes co-creation, as you said, Zabine, so beautifully. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. That, that, that was fantastic. Um, I think uh, one of the points that we should continue to talk about is work integrated learning as a social leveler, uh, which needs to be better understood, but uh, it's a very, very important part of, of what all of us see. And Shopify, if you're not familiar with yep. it, is Canada's sort of really hot tech company right now, hiring thousands, literally, of people in Ottawa and Toronto. And they've developed a really interesting program with Carleton University. So you talk about co-creation. This is a... And now with Concordia. Is that official? Yeah. Uh, not quite yet. Okay. We're, we're it's not official. Yeah, we're, we're pretty close. <laughs> so they have uh, created this program where you sign up uh, for first year of a computer science uh, program at Carleton. And you work, uh, what is it, 25 hours a week, I think? At, uh, I'll probably be wrong on that number, so don't quote me. No, but you, that, you, you, you work at Shopify, and you go to, to your courses. Your work at Shopify counts towards your, uh, uh, your degree. You essentially do a degree in five years, and you're paid uh, throughout. You get breakfast and lunch if you want to be there at that time at Shopify, because they have that Google model of feeding their employees. It's worth about $250,000, all costed out per student. Here's one of the fascinating parts which was not designed into the program. So every computer science program in the country is struggling to get some sort of gender balance. Yep. Even a hint of gender balance would be nice for, for most of them. 20% is a success in most uh, CS uh, programs. The Shopify program is 50-50. Just happened. Uh, visible minorities, I think it's, it's a quarter or a third sort of in that range. Yep. Just happened because barriers to entry, level, that social leveling power of work integrated learning was, uh, was taking effect. So it's thrilling that you guys are uh, Concordia doing yeah. this as well, because this, this can be a real positively contagious model for all sorts of programs across, uh, across the country. So Vas, it's been a while. Uh, <laughs> How have you been? <laughs> you don't call, Good, you don't you write. <laughs> Um, sorry, we like. Yeah, you. <laughs> I'll check. Oh my lord, she's been busy. It's a digital future. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Vas, as uh, I mentioned in the intros, was a, she was critical to us in the preparation of Humans Wanted. So thank you for that. Uh, your thinking, your guidance, your critique was fantastic. But has also been a key advisor to the federal government and now working at Airbnb. Love to hear your thoughts on what government should be doing. We've heard about sort of the general state about what business and, mm. and academia is, do, is doing. Where's the role? Or what is the role yeah. for government? So I think we've done a great job over the past day or so um, in terms of covering a lot of ground in terms of where government can, can be a leader, be it through portable benefits, um, evolving our social safety net. So maybe what I'll offer is a couple of instances of um, maybe they fall under co-creation or, or government leadership where uh, we're getting other actors involved and, and that's becoming successful and sort of creates a bit of immunity to uh, political changes and kind of different directions. Um, so one is, you know, when you guys were speaking about what can, what can larger firms do institutionally within, when you're, when you're a big firm, when you're a bank, like when you're a big consulting firm, that's great. You know, you can construct um, internal programs to encourage mobility so that people aren't just making lateral moves. But in the, in the new world of work, we also have, and when we compare it to a generation ago, more small and medium-sized enterprises than ever before, more nonprofit work, social enterprises, and a generation that's mission-driven and you know, drawn to particular work that may not provide them that mobility. So we're starting to see um, leadership and coalitions formed among businesses, not just banks, but RBC especially is a huge leader. Um, one of them is called, I'm gonna get it wrong, I'm gonna fudge it, but if you Google it, I think the right one will come up. Um, opportunity for all, and it's a bunch of actually service and, and retail employers, um, Starbucks, Telus, I'm not remembering all of them, but um, they've come together and they've set a goal where uh, over the next five years they want to find entry level placements for 40,000 neat youth. And that's pretty neat, N-E-A-T, because you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a government challenge, it wasn't convened you know, at a government table, um, it's external leadership um, working on a government problem, which we all can agree. I mean, I'm, I'm here as this voice for, you know, youth and like as a champion, um, having led not as an expert, but a champion and kind of cheerleader with the expert panel. And then on universities, I mean, you know I'm with you from our, from our prep call, 
But um, the de-risking of entrepreneurship is a fantastic thing where universities have evolved to support, give people that taste and sort of um, a safe space to, to experiment, to get exposed to these things because we want our young people, we want our workers of tomorrow to be creating economic value and being intra and entrepreneurial. Um, and even endowing people with those skills is something that I think is gonna be difficult for our institutions. Outside of government, before we get to do more rapid fire stuff together, um, let me point to one, one problem, not necessarily a policy problem, but maybe something that government um, will take on. During the work of the panel, people wanted to know, often they wanted to know, well, what's different now? Come on, Vass, like the numbers, you know, youth always do, you know, we worked with uh, young people aged 15 to 29. Oh, young people always fare a little worse than everyone else. What's the big deal? Why does this matter? Firstly, I think it's more a question for the government that struck the panel, but I'm happy to take it on and have been doing for some time. Here's one thing that's pretty different. The digitization of the labor market. So this is new. We take it for granted, right? We have access to more labor market information than ever before at our fingertips, round the clock, wherever we are. Somebody could have applied for a job, you know, right now while we're, while we're chatting and while we're here together. What does it mean for young people who are transitioning? What does it mean for young people looking for entry-level work? Um, somewhat perversely, it, it really increases the search costs, both for the uh, young learner, the recent graduate, and for the employer. And what that does is it uh, kind of hyper-privileges social capital. And I don't want to suggest that social capital is anything that's historically new, or that people weren't leveraging connections that they or their parents or a friend had in the 70s, 80s, or 90s. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say that we have embedded that into what we teach young people about how they find jobs. We tell them fairy tales, which is that you apply to a job with a cover letter and a CV, and then someone's going to call you. No, they're not, okay? <laughs> and you're going to, and, and what, what, what gets reflected back is the anxiety of, I'm being told, I'm entering a world of work, you know, the jobs aren't going to be there. We can also make that exciting. You're entering a world of work where you are going to be creating some of the jobs that are there. And it's exciting, you know, like here's, you know, and here's what we need to do to kind of build that. And then we're not able to give our young people that relevant entry-level work experience. So we also heard from a lot of young people who when you look at the numbers, okay, they're employed. They're employed full time, they have a job, you know, whatever the university college metrics are, X amount of time after you graduated, they have a job, boom, we're like, yes, the system works. What are they doing? Is it relevant to their area of interest? Does that summer job, you know, we have a Canada, we have a, we have a summer jobs program federally. That's not a youth employment strategy, that's a student employment strategy, and that's okay, but students also want to work during the scholastic year. We have more part-time students than ever before. That's amazing, right? We have more people who are the learners of the future. So how are institutions evolving and kind of helping them? The last thing I'll offer on the digitization piece is, you know, in theory, if we were talking about the, um, the internet and job matching, I don't know, a while ago here at this conference, we probably might have been like more utopian and being like, oh, what a relief. We're finally gonna get so efficient at matching. Because matching, it's, it's hard to do. For the economists in the room, I know you guys, I love you. You look at numbers, you're like, well, young people, there's some jobs over here, there's a lot more young people over here, do, 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 they should just, you know, move and take those jobs, we'd be fine. We still are terrible at matching people, and yet at the same time, these same technologies that I think, you know, have disrupted or are making these problems more pronounced could evolve and are starting to get there where we will be more effective at matching um, entry-level jobs, where we can reduce our biases, where we can say to firms who are saying, I have a deficit, I can't find people, let's find them. Let's you know, make those connections and maybe we'll have a more kind of rational, um, appropriate model rather than having people forge faux familiarity with you over coffee. And I know you all get those emails because you're great point people and entry level people and thank you for everyone, mm -hmm. every stranger that you've met with to give a few pieces of advice and ask for their C CV. That's not sustainable, that's not scalable, it's not appropriate, we can do better. <laughs> yeah, uh, Thank you. <laughs> we're going to be very short of time, so I'm, I'm mindful that we've just got maybe 15 minutes of that left. Um, 
Ed, Vas, I want to see if, if there's only one thing we can talk about. I think it needs to be this technology imperative because surely, just from the last day, we, we, we know generally what the challenge is out there. And there seems to be a general agreement on a range of solutions for this. This is not rocket science. These are great ideas and experiences up here. And we, as we're seeing, all of us on this uh, minute of the day, we have, we have the technology mm -hmm. and we're not using it. So you're, you work for Airbnb, there's an organization that does have the technology and is using it to transform. What's, what are we missing? Well, um, out of Ryerson, there's a program, what is the type, what is it called? It's like a dashboard, what is it? Exactly, so bad answer, start again. So, um, what, what could we be doing in terms of building those technologies? Oh, well, I mean, federally, federally with SkillsLink, if anyone's ever heard of SkillsLink, don't worry if you haven't because I don't think anyone actually uses it. I think people abuse it to post job postings and then say, oops, I couldn't find anyone. Ergo, can I please have a temporary foreign worker? So, if the federal government wants to retain that over skills matching, I swear that's how, I'm sorry. Look, wild card on the panel. So. <laughs> I, if government wants to retain that, if government wants to be like, no, 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 we're still, we're still owning SkillsLink, we can make SkillsLink rock, then make it rock. Use the talent we have in Canada, let's make a common platform, not just a platform at RBC, which I'm excited about, and I would upload all my skills and like tell you everything I have, I just don't work there. And let's also find complementary data sets. So look, we're never going to be satisfied with the quality and quantity of data that's out there. We're hungry for it, we want the best. Let's complement with things like and I know there's selection biases as well, but you know, I liked that survey that was up on the slide looking at Facebook, you know, businesses led by women that are active. Hey, that's something. LinkedIn, LinkedIn is making this great play for the skills lab, good for them. Um, but what about, they know where, where are the newest skills, where are the fastest growing skills, where's the mismatch between entry level jobs, you know, where, you know, when Harvey was talking about the entry level work in five years experience um, kind of conundrum. There, there are ways we can take that information and layer it in with what we already have. Recently, StatsCan mailed out the survey to the digital, you know, remember, to, to find out, hey, are you involved in any, in any digital activities? Hey, that's just how it goes. Um, <laughs> but we can always do better and we can always do a little bit more and it goes to being, you know, relinquishing that, that, that dominant, that it's like totally government-led. It's, it's going to be government-led, but with invitations to others to to have more information and have, have more talent and kind of build better, maybe build better platforms. Catherine, how much um, responsibility should be placed on the individual? A lot of the conversations I've heard. Whoops, I've lost my mic there. Just wondering how much responsibility needs to be placed on the individual. A lot of these com conversations are about what states right. should be doing, what systems should be doing. This is all also about individual action and presumably responsibility. I think it, the answer and how do we do, how, how do we do that and nudge them to make the choices in terms of time and resource allocation in their own lives to take advantage of what's out there? I think the answer is it, it depends. We we speak of the individual as if they, we're talking about a homogenous group that have uh, everyone has equal skills, competencies, access to to work, and so on. Um, for some, um, it's easy for them to take responsibility for, um, you know, try getting Vaz a job in, you know, in, in Wait till I tell comp my comp comp Yes, Wait exactly. Wait till I tell my exactly. I'm a try someone, master. this individual can get a job <laughs> anywhere. Um, when we take our neat individuals, when we take our youth who have not been exposed to um, the quality of education, um, access to workforce, access to mentoring, when we take newcomers who arrive here um, and if they don't have access to organizations like Triac and, and Access and others, um, and we tell them, well, take responsibility, I think we are doing the individual a disservice. So I think it really depends, and, and one of the things that um, we need to continue to strengthen um, is the role of intermediaries, the organizations that help to take um, policy to practice. And we can set the best policies in this room, but if we do not have strong intermediaries, strong not-for-profit organizations that help to bridge um, the wealth of knowledge to actual um, jobs and work on the ground, it's not going to work. And so we can't have a one strategy fits all for individuals. Okay. Uh, Zabine, just quickly on, on the corporate responsibility side, you've heard the numbers yesterday about how little 
uh, corporations spend on training and development, and we've debated whether those numbers are accurate or re reflective of what's really going on. Are those numbers close to being accurate of what's going on in, in, in the private sector, and what responsibility do employers have, have to bring on what ultimately is, a, is the individual's career and life? So on the, are the numbers accurate? Um, they're probably not perfect, but I'm not sure it matters that much. They're too low. Um, it, it, on the accuracy piece, we typically collect formal training um, costs, and training is not just done by the courses that we pay for. Uh, there are online platforms, there's the time of employees, there's coaching, there's feedback, there's so many different elements that go into training. Uh, but that said, um, given where we're going, and I think organizations that have been successful, organizations that have been, you know, that have sustainably had good results, we will probably see that they are spending more, they have spent more on training. So this idea of really disaggregating that data is really, really important. The problem with averages is, you know, you, it doesn't really capture um, capture what the real issues and where the real issues are. In terms of what organizations should be doing, I think everyone agrees that talent, human capital, is really the most critical success uh, factor for organizations and harder and harder to get. Um, so what, we, what organizations invest in, in it's, it's a little bit of putting your money where your mouth is, isn't it? Um, and I think what would be helpful, though, because then the question is, why isn't that happening? If it's such a no-brainer, is it being like, you know, what's, what's going on out there? Uh, I think there are a couple of elements there. One is in terms of some of the skills uh, the development that we're talking about. We need to find ways to, we, we need to define, we need to be able to assess. So even with work integrated learning, it's great. They had the experience. But what about some kind of pre and post skills assessment and some focus, deliberate focus on this is the one skill or the two skills that this person is going, going to be learning? And how do you measure uh, the payback to organizations on something like that? Now, you talked about the Amplify program. I would say two things there. First of all, last year anyway, when, when I was there, more than half of the students were born outside of Canada. The, the students on the program, while many of the, the, um, the solutions and the patents had a technology component, they came from all disciplines. So the diversity of those groups was, was really quite significant, and it happened naturally. People didn't set out to do it. It's because the way that people were selected um, in terms of bringing that, that uh, interdisciplinary uh, um, group of people together, that's where you landed. And that's, I would say, part of, part of that, uh, part of the magic there. Um, and, and then on evaluation, we talk a lot about evaluation in, you know, in academia. How do we bring some of those evaluation um, techniques, and it doesn't have to be perfect, I, I'll keep going back to that, where organizations can start to actually measure the impact of, of the, the, the reskilling, the upskilling, and start to share that and to bring others on by being able to say, because numbers matter. That's what gets businesses to, to react and respond to it. Um, and that's an area, again, of, I think, collabor of fast track collaboration. Um, we don't have to wait three years for new programs to put in place. There are already programs out there. So how do we go back and, and really learn from those and find ways to, um, to scale? So in terms of skills of the future, time management is one that I've always failed at. <laughs> and uh, I think I'll probably fail that again today. I think we're, we're almost out of time. But wanted to wrap up with a quick point from each of the panelists about what we should be thinking, uh, thinking about as we leave today. And maybe to focus it, if we are to gather a year from now, what would you want to see have happened? And Alan, maybe I'll... Uh, what, can you come back to me? I want to think about that for okay. more than a nanosecond. The, the thinker on the panel wants My to. My processing is slow. <laughs> I'll go. Um, I think you know, it's, it's clear what we need to have done. I think we need to have more of the programs and more of the initiatives that are taking place um, at ministries such as um, T 
TCU that's really forcing the collaboration among um, the major players, intermediaries, government, um, employ employers, um, community agencies, all around tackling the issue of employability, um, tackling the issue of skills and competencies, and um, getting that information out to those people who help to place individuals into roles. Uh, if we can come back with a more coordinated approach to um, getting that sort of research done and helping um, all segments of our population to be able to access jobs across the province, I think we would have made a huge difference. Great. Us? I mean, next year I'm going to be a scrum master, so <laughs> that'll change my thoughts. No, um, you know, I'll, I'll just present a different view on work integrated learning, which is I do think it's a great intervention and innovation that has responded to people reporting that they both want relevant work experience and employers saying that new graduates need it. Um, but I will point out that at the end of the day, is it not a paid work opportunity where either the student is paying through tuition or mom and dad are paying for it? And I, I worry and wonder as it becomes more ubiquitous, which at the same time it should, um, maybe it's going to kind of devalue entry level labor and kind of become the new unpaid internship. So where instead of, um, me as a scrum master employing a new graduate, maybe I'll just look for a work integrated learning student because they're cheaper. Uh, it's just a reality, of probably a negative externality of something great happening. So being mindful of who gets these opportunities, who it privileges, and who it could potentially hurt um, would be something great to keep back pocket. Um, so picking up on this kind of collaboration, co-creation, I'd like to really challenge our, the, the group and ourselves to have a um, reskilling program that where we're thinking big, we've started small, and we're ready to scale fast. I think we need to set big goals, um, and um, that would be what, uh, what I would be looking for in deciding whether I'd come back to next year's conference. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you don't know, maybe you don't want me to come back, so. That's perfect. Alan. Um, just uh, responding to Vass for one second. So Ontario introduced legislation while I was still in Ontario uh, against uh, unpaid internships, yeah. right? And something Quebec is now uh, considering. So I think there are efforts to safeguard against the free and cheap labor. We all know that when you are working with a student who's come from whatever institution, it is a lot of work. Like it, is, it's, it is not, you, if you're doing your job well, it is work. Yeah. So what I would hope for, John, to answer your question is, Two things. One is um, at the micro level for everybody in the room to come back, if you come back next year, to be able to say, I participated in some experiment, some pilot project in my own workplace around the future of work, that I, I helped move forward some experiment, something that would have us doing things differently than we were doing it today. And I think that um, it's very easy to be complacent in our, all of our jobs and, and not, to, not to be sort of always pushing. I think that on the micro level. On the macro level, what I would love to see is, um, and I'm not a huge, I'm an American, so I'm not like uh, always looking to government for all the answers, but I would love to see government in this case, federally and, and provincially, think of uh, incentives that they can offer the private sector to push ahead on um, new integration with universities. So as I said earlier, it's very difficult for us to run co-op programs, it's extremely expensive. There's a lot of um, hidden costs around maintaining staff relationships. So Zabine and I can be on a panel, but if when she was at RBC, like for us to have effective placements at RBC, I needed a small army of people, and probably she did too, right? Just managing that. And then if somebody retires, moves, gets annoyed, there's more work to be done, yeah. right? So these are expensive. So are there tax incentives, policy incentives? Great. Let me wrap up with uh, three quick thanks. First of all, thanks to the audience for, for your, your, your attention and, and your forgiveness for us not getting to uh, questions from the floor, but maybe over lunch you can buttonhole the panelists uh, with, uh, with questions or more provocations. Um, secondly, to the organizers uh, for yeah. including me and us in this, but also for a terrific conference. This has yeah. been fantastic. So well, well done, Margaret and team, for an outstanding conference. And then lastly, to the panelists, you've been fantastic. Thank you. So, Appreciate you uh, spending the time with us this morning and sharing those great uh, words of in inspiration. So thank you, uh, thank you each. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Do you want any directions for lunch? Follow the food? Follow your nose? Food is there, it's still raining, come back at one. <laughs>